working with Steve Zemke on uh, his bill 1703 in the state legislature that we were all hoping would pass this year. And in contacting some of the members of the committee where it was currently at, um, Representative Noel Frame from the 36th LD was one of the legislators that I contacted and she wrote back and said, yes, I support that and would you also look at the bill that I've presented to 117, which is a pathway to modernize and rebalance Washington state tax, uh, tax structure. So I said, I would be happy to and would you come and talk to us about it? So now that the legislative session is over, um, Representative Frame has agreed to be with us today and uh, to talk about, about the whole tax situation. So welcome and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. first two years of which are funded and authorized in the budget. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so just to kick it off, for folks that don't know me, I figured I'd give about this much background and explain um, why I do this work. Um, I had to laugh because I was at Friday, I did the same presentation to the tax division of the State Bar Association. And they're like, yeah, first and foremost, let, let Noel tell us why, because we're all tax attorneys, so we know why we do this stuff. But like, why do you care? Um, and it um, really boils down to education funding at the end of the day. Um, so uh, you all know this, but this McCleary lawsuit you've been hearing about so much, uh, that didn't start five years ago or 10 years ago. Uh, the state's been out of compliance with fully funding education for a very long yeah. time. Uh, Seattle schools sued the state uh, in the 1970s. They won, but nothing happened. Uh, fast forward 20 years later when I was in high school, <coughs> Um, I grew up in the state, but I grew up in the Battleground School District. <coughs> Battleground is one of those places in the state that they just don't like taxes. Yeah. Uh, and because the state was, you know, advocating its responsibility to fully fund public education, and we were counting on local levies uh, to pay for the basics of schools. Uh, well, I was in a school district that ran and lost three levies in the four years I was in high school, so we just didn't have the basics. Uh, and I watched every year that I was in school things get cut. And uh, you know, I was paying enough attention as a teenager that I, I understood the basic premise of the problem. Uh, and so I went to school in Washington, D.C., got involved in politics, I worked on the campaign side, and it was around um, 2007 or 8 when the campaign to um, change the levy requirement from 60% down to simple majority happened. I got involved in that, I got involved in PTA, and fast forward a few years later and I ran for the legislature the first time, lost that race, but then came back three years later, got appointed to the legislature. So I've been in the legislature for three and a half years, though this is my clicker, right? Three and a half years, and um, I serve on the Finance Committee, uh, which is the committee in the House that deals with taxes. I was a vice chair for a couple of years uh, and serve on this tax structure work group, which I'll talk about today. So I think it's really boring when people talk at you for like an hour. So I am really gonna encourage you to ask me questions in this. I am also, if we get too far off track, gonna try to reel us in um, and so that we can actually get through the presentation. Or if you're asking a question that I uh, address later, I will let you know. But it's much more fun when it's interactive. Um, so please ask questions. Okay, so what I'm gonna do today is talk about um, you know, what a, a good tax code should look like um, and how we measure up, and spoiler alert, we're kind of terrible. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about kind of what we're gonna do about it. So first I kind of wanted to walk through what are sort of the premises of a, a good tax code. I do have notes for myself mostly just to keep myself on track. I get very animated um, and I lose track of time. So, um, so when you talk about what's necessary for kind of a well-designed tax system, you kind of look at, you know, from an economic economist standpoint, folks that this is not partisan at all. This is just what do you need to have a good well-designed tax code. 
Um, I boil it down to sort of four basic principles. There's others, but these to me were the core principles. Uh, the code should be equitable, adequate, stable, and transparent. Uh, we are none of those things. Um, our tax code is a relic of 1935. Um, I think you all probably know the backstory, but um, property taxes were quite high. The great people of the state of Washington uh, voted in a uh, personal income tax by popular vote. The Supreme Court struck it down, saying it was unconstitutional, it was a progressive income tax, uh, and said um, property income is property. We have this uniformity clause in our Constitution that all property has to be taxed equally, therefore progressive income tax is not allowed. As a sort of stopgap measure, they put into place uh, the business and occupation tax that was supposed to be temporary. It wasn't called B&O then, but basically a tax on business. Uh, and later added excise taxes, and that temporary tax, of course, we still have today. So when we say it is a relic, it really is. Very little has been done to update the tax code uh, structurally since 1935. So let's talk about these four values and sort of what they are. So when we talk about the principle of equity, I'm gonna nerd out big time for a moment. There's, there, there's vertical equity, and then there's horizontal equity. And so vertical equity is that concept that people should pay taxes in relation to their ability to pay, right? And, and generally, if you talk to folks, there's sort of a general acceptance that folks that are deeply poor should probably pay little to no taxes, and particularly as you compare it to those who are very wealthy, you know, that's kind of, that's actually a fairly popular opinion if you divorce it from specific policy proposals that people have to vote. So that's vertical equity. Uh, horizontal equity is the concept that like taxpayers should pay like taxes. So you want to avoid, like the, the concept is the government shouldn't have just completely arbitrary taxation. If you're a comparable taxpayer, you should pay comparable taxes. Uh, we, uh, you know, we strike out on these. So on the concept of ver vertical equity, I'm sure you have all heard this, we're the most regressive tax code in the nation. Uh, so when you compare how much really low income people pay, so households less than 24,000 are paying 17.8% in tax, households with $545,000 and over, uh, are paying 3%, and that is a six time, six X differential. Wow. This is unacceptable. Everybody, I, I would say, I would like to say everybody knows it, but I, I have to laugh that some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have started to question the concept of whether or not the code is regressive. Um, and, uh, and then the next day, folks on the other side of the aisle are talking about regressive taxation and how we can't have a gas tax and other things because it's regressive. So. I think there's a general acceptance that the code is regressive. Uh, it is not right that uh, the lowest income uh, among us are paying six times more in income as a share of their taxes as compared to the wealthiest folks in the state. So that's something we really need to work on. Um, and then I mentioned the B&O tax. I also would argue that the B&O tax is also quite regressive. So the B&O tax, for those of you who don't pay it or aren't familiar, well, you all pay it, let's just be clear. It is passed through to you as customers, but you don't see it. If you're not writing that check to the Department of Revenue, you don't see this, but the business and occupation tax, it's on gross receipts. So every dollar that comes through your door as a business, you're paying tax on no matter if you make a profit or not. Um, and it's really stifling innovation in the state. It is great for very large corporations. Um, it's really tough for um, small startup and low margin businesses. Uh, and a, a low margin business example are like manufacturers uh, and car dealers are another one because they have such high capital costs, uh, their ultimate margins are very low and those taxes are on every dollar that comes through, uh, including the cost of those goods. Yes? So one of the reasons I find it, I, I'm a small business person okay. and one of the reasons I find this very regressive is every time I go through to file my B&O taxes, I walk past all the pages where I could be exempt yes. if I were manufacturing aircraft. Mm -hmm. And you know, yep, yep. I, I still end up with my B&O taxes, which are then also used as the basis for my city taxes. Mm -hmm. And it's on the growth, so if I, as a, I, I'm a consulting scientist, if I bring in a contractor to do work, which I typically do, yep. because then my insurance, my professional liability insurance is on the hook for the work of that contractor, my B&O tax is based on the collective of their work and my work. Yep. So if my part is 50,000 and their part is 450,000, they pay B&O on their 450,000, 
I pay B and O on my five hundred thousand. That's exactly right. So that even problem, though I only take yeah, B yeah, not fifty thousand. Just yeah. so everybody understands, yeah. it's two percent on five hundred thousand, not on fifty thousand. That's exactly right. So that amount that hits my pocketbook, yeah. and under King County contracting codes, I'm not allowed to recoup any of that. That's supposed to come out of my profits. And that that wow. concept, that problem is called pyramiding. And it's a problem, I, you know, I'll get to the kind of what we're gonna do about it later. Um, it's something I kind of knew about, but when I actually got out on the road and started talking to taxpayers directly, business taxpayers, pyramiding came up a lot. And I work for a small business as well, we use subconsultants a lot, and this is absolutely, it's, it's a challenge. Um, so, but your segue is also perfect because, I so this is the vertical equity piece, so that um, horizontal equity that we should tax like payer, taxpayers like tax, um, so in theory, we do this right. So we have different categories. So like on the B&O tax, we have wholesaling, retailing, um, service, and I'm forgetting one, manufacturing. So we kind of group them by fours and we have different rates so that if you, you fit into one of those four buckets. But of course, in practice, when you have 700 tax exemptions, and our friend Mr. Zemke has been working on this for years, this is why we're violating horizontal equity. Because we pick winners and losers in the tax code through all these tax preferences. Now, I will just say, in those 700, they're not all corporate, they're not all B&O, it's about roughly, roughly a third, a third, a third. This is actually out of date, they're updating this now, so it says 694, we hit 700 in 2017. And the, this is the Department of Revenue's tax exemption study, which they do every couple of years, so they're um, starting- Every four years. Every four, sorry, thank Unlike you, Unlike most other states. Yeah. They do it in two years, California does it every year. And they're doing it again right now. So we'll have an update to this, but we are over 700. And you know, so here I am as, as a legislator, let me just tell you how this looks from my perspective. I sit on the finance committee, and I don't have a real number, but I swear it's gotta be like 70% of the time that I spend in hearings is on tax preferences. And, and so much of that um, is about equity. So you know, what, we, what we have is, we, because we pick winners and losers, uh, let's say somebody with a B&O, you know, is paying B&O tax, and they don't have a preference, but somebody that kind of looks like them does have a tax preference. So then, so much of our hearings are just coming in saying, well, so-and-so got it, so I should get it too. Wow. And, and they're really rational requests, right? They're really rational and very well thought out requests, and it's hard to say no. And <coughs> I, I mean, I've talked through this with my colleagues, like, yeah, these all sound good individually, guys, but the cumulative effect, you see this number down here? We forego $50 billion of revenue every biennium. Wow. And when this was done, uh, we're, our budget this year was $52 billion, but when this was done, this meant that we were, we were foregoing more revenue than we were collecting every biennium. It has been going up every session. Of, of course it has. I mean, yeah. we've, you know, we, we've got up like, how many tax preferences since like the 90s? We're at like three or four hundred in the nineties, quite a few, and we're at seven hundred now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another way of looking at it is it's a combination of foregone revenue and doubling up taxes on other people. Right. That's exactly right. Because we need, we still need the revenue to run the state. The money's got to come in. We're so folks ourselves. like me yep. are paying twice as much yep. as we would if it were <laughs> equitable. Yep. And you could, you know, you you could by redistributing this not give me 50% back, but give me 20% back. Cut my taxes a little bit and still bring in a huge amount of additional revenue to fund our schools, our mental health system, our roads, you know, everything that we need to do as a civilization. So this is, this is absolutely right. I mean, when I talk about why the tax preferences are a problem and, and why like, why this, this is like the perf, by the way, the tax code and the preferences in particular are like the perfect illustration of the inappropriate role of money in politics. Because the people who get tax relief are the people that have enough money to hire lobbyists <laughs> and come down yeah. and ask for relief. And the drum I've been beating in the three and a half years I've been there is we as legislators should be fighting for all taxpayers, not just the people who can afford the time and treasure to come ask us for relief. It's, yeah, thanks. <laughs> like, You'd think that that would be popular. Like, it is. Right? Like, <laughs> like people kind of get it, but like the they don't follow through with action. Steve. Yeah, I mean, the other point here is that I've made a lot is that just calling them tax preferences, we're one about the only state that does that. Right. Every other state calls them tax expenditures, even the U.S. Congress That's right. has a tax expenditure budget, meaning it's money that you 
then collect that the state is giving out to a business before they even deal with the state budget. Yes. And that significant figure is that we're giving away actually more than we collect in terms of, of revenue. Yeah, that's exactly right. We, we had a presentation by an outside expert that used that language. It ruffled some feathers in the finance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I see question in the back, go one, two, three. No. Da oh, I saw, you oh, know Forgive me, I didn't see your hand, go ahead. So are the incentives given uh, a few years ago to Boeing to stay here? Yeah. Uh, are they considered preferences yes. or are they off books? Okay. No, they're, they're definitely calculated. And they have, are, of course, the most generous in the nation. So, in a sense, and subsidizing Boeing to stay here. Oh yeah, and, and and subsidizing them to stay here. They they laid off twelve or thirteen thousand people after we passed the preferences. And it's one it's it's why and we have a whole other conversation about preferences. But it's why having um, ten year sunset dates, having tax preference performance statements. And increasingly, we need to have clawbacks when we do these preferences. Yeah. Um, yeah. And because we didn't have clawbacks, and because we didn't have proper accountability, really specific metrics, or specific accountability mechanisms in Boeing's uh, tax preferences, when things started to hit the fan for them, we're the one who lost the jobs because the other states have built in stronger wow. um, preferences. Yeah. So I ran that bill a couple times. I'll tell you, it, it's it's tough. And um, it gets popular every time Boeing lays off more people. It's been kind of quiet lately. Uh, we have a whole other conversation coming up. They uh, have lost their fight with WTO. And so technically, uh, our tax preferences for Boeing are a violation of the World Trade Organization's rules. Um, and so we're wow. trying to figure out exactly when and how we're gonna fix that. So right here and then Janet. You know, um, from a standpoint of a business, especially an out-of-state business who feels they have a fiduciary duty to their shareholders, you know, they're they're like pigs at a trough coming to Washington right. State. They love the environment yeah. for business yep, here. They do. How do we explain to them that this is actually a good deal all around and they would in the long term benefit from the environment that it creates? Because to them, they just see money flowing in and they're pleasing their stockholders. So large corporations and folks that are based out of state, um, status quo is pretty great for them. Who we need to fix the tax code for are small, independent Washington state businesses because they're the ones that have a competitive disadvantage under the tax code. So if you're somebody who believes in a local, diversified economy, if you're somebody who believes in innovation, believes in supporting local small businesses, you wanna fix the tax code. If you're just fine with subsidizing corporations, uh, having corporations uh, from out of state that don't pay a lot of taxes, status quo is great. Um, as you can imagine, uh, this fight will be quite challenging because the folks for which the status quo benefits, uh, they are very powerful and have a lot of money. Uh, and it's frankly, it's part of why I'm here talking to a group like you all. We need to build a grassroots movement and demand. We need taxpayers and I would say individuals, and I'm really hoping small local independent businesses really join this fight to demand that status quo is no longer acceptable and we need to change it. And so that's what we're hoping to do. Janet. Yeah, I, I wonder if you could go back a few slides to, um, you talked about, uh, yeah, what that one there. Yeah. So I was wondering, does that include, um, who is actually paying? Does that include what uh, people are paying for, you know, sales tax? Yes. And what people are paying for property tax? Yes. It does. So yep. this State is all, just, yep. yeah, because it just, all those it's all you know, together not to mention um you know kind of little extra taxes that you pay on your utilities yeah. to your local government fees and all that stuff yeah. yeah we have a gazillion fees we nickel and dime the taxpayers yes. yeah. 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 because we have we have chosen not to use certain revenue sources and it's really i actually think it undermines confidence in government mm -hmm. uh, because we constantly yes. have to increase taxes because it's structure i'll get to adequacy in just a second we constantly have to raise taxes to keep up with natural growth um, and then we have all these little fees to try to, you know, figure it out around the margins. Uh, and it, it really is contributing to pe people not trusting government. Right here. I'm kind of wondering if we would have had a more equitable and responsible tax code, mm -hmm. would we have stifled Amazon's great, just incredible growth? So uh, for the record, Amazon pays all their state taxes. Amazon doesn't have any tax preferences. Hmm. Yay! So, no. <laughs> so they, so all the reports that you see, 
like uh, Amazon paid zero dollars in tax. It's in reference to federal taxes. So um, Microsoft back in the day got some subsidies that have now been um, sunsetted, um, but Amazon doesn't have preferences. So they their innovation was in no way, shape, or form stifled by the Oh, state just tax. wait till Guy Palumbo gets to work. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> just and kind of going back to what Jenna said, I mean, when we're out canvassing, one of the things that I'm hearing most is we keep going back to sales tax yep. and property tax, yep. and that's forcing retired people out of their homes. That's right. It's it's so damaging, and yep. people are so weary that yep. it seems like we're ripe for, <coughs> for this grassroots movement. I think change. so too. And I will just say, and this was sort of, it's always good to know your history. So again, if you go back to the 1930s when there was a progressive income tax adopted by popular vote, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it was in the context of property taxes had gotten too high. And so when you think about that, it's like, sound familiar? <laughs> you know, like, so it's just, I think, I think you're right, Liz, that it is time. And it is pretty baffling to me as a, a, a legislator that we do go back over and over and over and over to the tax sources that hurt middle class people, and we can't bring ourselves to actually ask the wealthy to pay their fair share, or actually go after the biggest preferences. Um, so, yeah. All right, yes, Dave, and then I'm gonna go to the next slide. Yeah. Last question, a couple of weeks ago I saw that the governor was on the TV uh, yeah. saying that he had been kind of, uh, he had been hoodwinked yep. by the bomb. Mugged. Yeah, right, any Maybe chance for a, a do-over on that deal? Yeah, so I don't know about the do-over for Boeing, and again, I think we might have an opportunity here within the next year because of the WTO. Um, you know, I mean, I, there's a lot I could say there, but I think that that, because of the WTO, that's probably our opportunity to finally fix that, um, and I think we're in just a little bit of a waiting period right now. Um, what I will say is uh, the governor's office will be part of the tax structure work group. I think that... Um, it they were is last time too. Huh? They were last time too, I think. Yeah, but I think that there's a real recognition. I think what Jay said is a real uh, reflection of, you know, it's hindsight is 2020. Um, but when you know when you have the biggest tax preference package in the nation uh, and then you lay off thirteen thousand people, something went terribly wrong. Um, <clears throat> I will also say, and to his point, you know, it's we are operating in a in a national and a global economy. And uh, there is something that needs to be done at the federal level. Like we're gonna have to fix our code here at home. Um, but the reality is states are pitted against each other and that's why tax preferences happen. Uh, and I've got countless stories about talking people that come in and they're talking to me about their tax preferences. And, and I don't think they recognize how insulting what they're saying is. Uh, and you know, it's because it's become the norm to pit states against each other. Yeah. So, yeah. all right, so let's talk about adequacy. So adequacy is the concept that a well-designed tax system should be able to provide the revenue necessary um, for basic, you know, public services and goods uh, with natural sort of population growth and natural economic activity. Um, Washington State is growing very rapidly. Um, we have, I forget my exact number, we, we've added about 20% population since the early 90s, 1.3 million people. Uh, over the next 15 years, we're on track to hit 9 million. Uh, and so our population is growing really fast. And as we all know, the code uh, is really not keeping up with that population growth. Uh, as evidenced by the next slide, um, so our revenue is just totally decoupling from economic activity. We're not the only state this is happening to, um, but it's definitely happening to us. And what this slide is showing you is since 1995, how much revenue we are um, paying as a share of our personal income. This is an average, it's not, it's not uh, put out by decile of um, income. Uh, we have gone from 6.8% down to 4.7%. So our tax burden has been going down uh, dramatically since the 90s. Now, your tax burden may not have gone down. <laughs> so to be clear to the, con the whole concept about shifting and who's paying, um, if you feel like your taxes have gone up, they probably have, because other folks have not had their taxes go up, and in fact have gotten tax cuts uh, since the 90s. Um, so this is a this is a huge problem for us uh, in terms of our ability to provide public services. Um, the other piece, uh, legislating by lawsuit, is really becoming the norm. Because we are struggling in this fight around adequacy, people have figured out the best way to get us to address problems is to sue us. Wow. Right, so McCleary was the big yeah. one that everybody knows about. Um, True Blood, an issue around behavioral health um, and people's um, civil rights relating to um, 
uh, evaluation um, for um, for trials, basically, whether or not, I'm, the, the, there's a term that's escaping my brain right now, um, whether or not they need to be civilly committed, whether or not they're comp competent to stand trial. Thank you, there it is. Um, so that's the true blood lawsuit. Washington v. United States is around fish culverts. Um, our tribes have treaty rights to um, a certain supply of salmon, uh, and because the state has put in fish culverts, if you're not familiar with culverts are, it's like you go through a stream, but you need a road to go over it, so you put in basically a big kind of steel, riveted steel tube, pipe. or maybe it's a little bit. pipe. Huh? A pipe. It's, a, it's, it's a yeah, pipe. it's like a big pipe, thank you. Um, and those, because of the sediment that builds up, uh, it makes the water really shallow and it's made it impossible, in some cases, for salmon to go upstream for spawning, um, and so the salmon population is down. Um, of course, we are seeing this now, the, the, the kind of end result of that uh, is our orcas are starving, uh, because Chinook salmon is their sole food source. Mm -hmm. um, so we got sued for that. Uh, I am waiting for the shoe to drop on state and local, local governments funding us, uh, or sorry, suing us uh, for unfunded mandates. I'm just waiting. Mm -hmm. um, so sure this is a this is a problem for us, and it makes it really difficult for us to, um, you know, to be legislators and actually run the state. The last thing I'll say on this: um, our other our friends on the other side of the aisle. This was their message all session. We've had extraordinary revenue growth. We've had the surplus. We don't need to raise taxes, and just to illustrate the point, we did have some revenue growth, 4.5 billion additional dollars that came in, but when we say additional expenses 2017-19 was 5.8 million, that was our maintenance level budget, our carry forward. So when we walked into this session, we were already down 5.8 billion. Now we had 4.5 come in, that was helpful. That still meant we had a budget deficit of 1.8 billion before we passed a single piece of legislation. That is Surplus. very difficult. And also, like, the other thing that just kills me is, like, we have a budget stabilization account so that most of that extraordinary revenue immediately goes to the budget stabilization account or the rainy day fund, um, which is a great tool, don't get me wrong, but it also means it's not readily accessible by a simple majority vote, which our friends also love to ignore. Yeah? So what's the deal? Why don't we have a state income tax? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and I'm sorry, I, I, know about, uh, I know about the 1930s. Yeah. Let's actually come back to the discussion of how to fix it uh, at the end of the presentation, because I'll talk to you a little bit about the process and kind of what I've already heard so far. Um, we'll come back to that. Yeah. I just want to be one other quick point to, to put out in terms of the budget is that we think we're being overtaxed in the state. If you listen to people like Ivan, the State Department of Revenue says, I think we rate, rate about 34th to 35th or something like that. Yeah. In terms of state and local yep. taxes, the 35th lowest yep. compared to other states in the country. But in, in, but that's an average for the whole state, yeah. right? So if you think about, do you are you paying more no, taxes? I, you probably are. If you are a middle income person, a senior citizen, a low income person, um, if you are a, a wealthy individual in the state, you're not. Uh, you're not. So Steve, your point is well yeah. taken. Um, and I actually your, I, your point is too in the sense that yeah. I, we can understand why people at the lower end right. perception is reality, taxed. right? Yeah. And they're definitely yeah. feeling that they are taxed more, and in many cases that's true. Some people it's not true, but perception is very All right, so let's talk about stability. Um, stability is the concept that you should have a, a well-designed tax system, should be able to bring in enough revenue to provide for basic services despite major fluctuations in economic activity, right? Um, again, we do not do well. I actually don't like this chart. I'm working on a better chart, but as I understand it, um, you know, we kind of have this boom and bust cycle where when, we're, when we have a good economy like we do now, our revenue is strong. So like basically we've had uh, extraordinary uh, revenue, just almost every, I mean, every report since I've been in the legislature for three and a half years, we've had extraordinary revenue. And so it kind of it kind of outperforms economic activity, but then when we hit recession, which is this point, we underperform the economy in a really big way too. So the chart, I know I've got this chart in my head of like kind of, it kind of out, uh, out looping um, economic activity. Um, and you know we have some sales, uh, we have some tax sources that are stable, but we're so dependent on sales tax, and that's so volatile that that's where a bulk of our lack of stability is coming from. Do you have a question? I thought I saw him. Oh, right here. I have a question, and I'm, I'm not an economic expert at all, but um, do you have a projection to the future? Because when I hear things like the federal, the president's, you know, tariffs and stuff are going to hurt yeah. imports and. Yeah. I think Washington State is, has the highest. They're very trade dependent. Amount of, yeah, we're very trade dependent. Yep. Is there a 
objection that, that not not that I've asked for. Um, you know, I mean, I know it's hurting uh, our folks. Uh, it's hurting the agricultural sector. Um, uh, there was one, uh, the port of I want to say Longview uh, has had some of their worst numbers in their history um, because of the tariffs. Uh, and I hope people are paying attention. That's the 19th legislative district, and that's a district that, in terms of its current legislative representation, is split. Yeah, so there's right. an impact on business, but everybody needs to understand that tariffs or taxes that you're paying, right. China and other countries are not paying those. We are in terms of higher costs for products that come from those countries, so yeah. the, 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 pro the products that are resold here. Yeah, yeah. So I mentioned the BSA earlier. Um, the budget stabilization account, um, I will say the last major work that was done on the tax structure, the tax structure study committee that had their report in 2001, um, one of the things in their recommendations was creating a budget stabilization account. And so it was one of the things that came out of that work. This was adopted. Um, you know, I will say it's frustrating as a legislator sometimes to have that money locked up, but from a governance standpoint, it's actually a really good tool. Um, so I think we should all strive to have money <coughs> locked away, just like we do for personal savings. This is the way that um, we help try to mitigate some of that um, instability in our code is through the budget stabilization. Okay, so then on transparency, um, transparency from a bell, uh, again, principles of a well-designed tax system, um, the principle of transparency is that tax burden should be clear and evident. Uh, and again, we have the least transparent tax code in the entire country. Um, this little screenshot grabbed from a Seattle Times article, uh, you see Oregon is number one in transparency, uh, Washington is number 49, and what, the point is taxpayer, in Washington, taxpayers don't know how much they owe or when they owe it. Okay, so in Oregon, that has the most transparent tax code, it's because they have an income tax, people write a check with a specific amount by a deadline. Mm -hmm. That is an example of clear and evident taxation. People know. Mm -hmm. Now ours, like theoretically, it's clear and evident because we have sales tax and there is a line right there on our receipt, but how many of you keep every single receipt for every single purchase that you have all year long? Yeah, nobody does. Like, oh yeah, right. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, so in you know, kind of in that cumulative effect, nobody actually knows what their total sales tax burden is. Um, I mentioned earlier that you may not pay B&O tax, but you do pay B&O tax because it's passed through to you as a customer. If you're a renter, maybe you don't pay property tax, but property tax is certainly passed through to you in your rent. Um, those are all examples of how our tax code um, is not at all transparent. Yes, Anne. Yeah, uh, following up on that with Steve's bill regarding transparency for the B&O, uh, I had a brief meeting with Larry Springer, mm -hmm. who assured me that Steve's bill was unnecessary because I could find out all the tax exemptions in the B&O. It was all on record. I could just look for that. And he hadn't finished his breath when he got to the topic about how I couldn't learn about Boeing's because that was a trade secret. Yeah. Yeah. So and that was... You know, those two sentences were within 30 yeah. seconds of each other. Yes. It's fully transparent. You can find anything you want. Except wow. everything. Except, Except everything you actually want. <laughs> Except when your tax preferences affect, I think, if three or less taxpayers, then um, then it's not available, because then that would be disclosing specific taxpayers. There, there are 50, 50 exemptions that are not reported. Only the chair of the yep. House Finance Committee. Wow. And that. the vice chair. Vice chair. Cool. That was fun power to There's only a couple of you in the legislature yeah. that get yeah. that information. No, it's true. So, um, and I think the point about, yes, it is all out there. That, that is true. But from a budgeting standpoint, too, like, we need to understand these are, we are, they're tax expenditures, as Steve said earlier. We are choosing to forego revenue. And so, like, part of this is understanding you may want to vote for all these tax preference over here, but you have to understand the impact and how much revenue we're going to forego because we're going to have to pay for it somehow. And if that we forego that money over here, that means we don't have money over here. And it, it, it's just not done that way. Uh, and it's, it's a problem from a governance standpoint. So I think the efforts to you know have a tax expenditure budget, that's part of that. And so yeah, maybe it's out there, but it's about looking at it side by side. So, um, okay, so how do we fix it? Ta da this is so much fun. Okay, so I want to tell you kind of um, kind of what we have been doing and um, the approach, um, what I'm suggesting, uh, which is a little bit different. So um, in my introduction to you all, one of the things that I did not mention 
um, is uh, my last full-time job before I became a legislator was I ran a group called Progressive Majority Washington, and I know many folks in this room because of that. Um, my job was to recruit, train, and help elect candidates to state and local government. Um, and part of that work, I actually worked at the Budget and Policy Center and actually helped to educate candidates about the tax code. So my like very direct work on tax reform in the state really started about 10 years ago. Um, and because of that work, I was part of what we call the Revenue Coalition, where it's a bunch of progressive organizations um, are trying to grow the pie rather than sort of fighting over the scraps um, per this advocacy issue. Um, we have been trying to raise revenue through that strategy for, for almost a decade, and we have largely failed. Um, and so as I came into this, uh, you know, translating or kind of transferring from a staff role to a legislator role and trying to be really thoughtful about how we finally kind of crack this nut that is the tax code. This is literally the most vexing political issue in the state of Washington since 1935, okay? Yep. Like, it is tough. Um, and, uh, you know, basically I just said, we need to reset the table and we need to figure out um, who else is being affected by the code that perhaps we're not talking to. Um, so I'll talk about that in a second. I also, let me come back to you in just a second. Um, I also looked at previous efforts that the legislature has engaged in. Um, and basically every effort that has been tried has been a bunch of legislators and lobbyists and sometimes academics around a table in Olympia. Uh, it has not been large-scale public engagement. It has not brought taxpayers along in the conversation about why the code doesn't work. Um, I think most taxpayers you know, have a perception, um, and in some cases it's real, that they are overtaxed, but it's super complicated. I, I think there's probably folks I serve with that don't totally understand the code. It's taken me the entire three and a half years I've been there to really, I think, grasp it in a way that's helpful. Um, I think a lot of people just tune it out, but we need to really engage the public, so I'll talk about that. Yes. So oh, I work in home health. Yes. And um, I'm a pediatric private duty nurse. It's a fabulous job. I work with great kids that um, have disabilities, medical mm -hmm. complexity. And we're small business, mm -hmm. small businesses with this small provision of home health is, uh, is low profit margins to no profit margins, yeah. to negative profit yep. margins. And um, and uh, I I just it's really nice to hear a solution. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and, and so great segue. Um, I am a firm believer, as a progressive Democrat, that we do a terrible job engaging the small business community. Mm -hmm. mm. Terrible. And those are our allies. I think it is from a value standpoint. I think a strong local diversified economy is kind of part of our core values in democracy, right? It's about distribution of power. It's about diversity so that we're not a one company town. When one company shutters its doors, half the economy goes away, right? So from a strong democratic principle standpoint, we want to support our local independent businesses and kind of big picture, we kind of do a terrible job engaging them. Um, so when I say kind of reset the table and bring different stakeholders to the table, I believe firmly as sort of a progressive movement, if we bring in and help small business, not only understand, because they understand it, but give them a, a way to express that frustration. Um, I do not believe that the current organizations that say they represent small business, by and large, they do a very poor job actually representing the interests of small business. Um, they represent all businesses, by and large. Um, and surprise, the big guys went out every time in terms of their legislative priorities. Um, groups that are specifically dedicated to small business, they're coming to the table. Um, and so what we did this year, so the bill I mentioned, we mentioned earlier, 2117, that ultimately <coughs> became a, a tax a budget proviso. It's a four-year plan to restructure the state's tax code. It leaves all options on the table, but it doesn't presuppose an outcome. So what this bill does is it creates a process. At this point, this, pro this does not create a legislative solution. It creates the architecture to create one. And I actually think that that's really important for what I said earlier that we have done, uh, no, no effort in the past has really tried to engage the public. Uh, we have robust analysis involving technical experts. That is something that we've done before, but we're actually gonna have to take that analysis out to the public once it's done. I think by and large, it sat on the shelf with the exception of like the budget stabilization account and a couple of other kind of incremental recommendations that came out of the last effort. Um, that, uh, we'll talk about that in a second. 
Target stakeholder input from <coughs> So go out to the small businesses, go out to the startups, go out to the low margin businesses specifically because they're the ones that are being hurt the most under the current code and bring them into the conversation and go out to low income and middle income people and organizations that organize both of these communities. Um, bring them to the table to specifically give us feedback once we have some alternatives from this analysis. I'll come to you in just a second. I've mentioned the statewide tour here directly from taxpayers, and I think this last piece is important. It's not just a report. It's a four-year plan that includes a prompt to legislators to actually develop legislative proposals, and this time the voting members of the group are the legislators and somebody from the governor's office, the people that are actually gonna have to take all this work and translate it into a legislative solution. They're the ones that are, you know, the core voting members um, at the table. Yes. Well, as a small business person myself, with uh, four or three partners, um, coming to the table to discuss this issue is a great idea. Well, how do you answer the question of people who, who are ready and willing to come to the table? I mean, where do they go? Right now? Yeah. Okay, I'll talk about that at the very end. Okay. Uh, thank you. So let me tell you though, kind of how I got to this point right here. Uh, I mentioned earlier, this is the Tax Structure Work Group has been around for a couple of years. So uh, last year it was just the House and it was just one person per caucus, so one Democrat, one Republican. Um, Representative Ter Terry Neely, who was our ranking Republican member on finance uh, in the last biennium, uh, joined on this effort with me. He's now retired, which breaks my heart because he was a great partner in this effort. Um, and we said, you know what, we're gonna go talk to taxpayers, we're gonna listen to them, and, and we have some assumptions about what the challenges are of the code, but let's do some intentional outreach, particularly to the business community, um, ask our progressive friends to promote these, and let's just hear what people have to say. And so we did four meetings, Spokane, Yakima, Vancouver, and Seattle. We uh, did a basic 15 minute presentation on the tax code, so people were starting with a sort of shared basis of knowledge, which was from our nonpartisan staff. Um, then we sort of, we, we broke up the whole room into small groups and asked them to answer three questions. Um, do you like the code or not? And if you don't, surprise, most people said they don't. Uh, if you don't like the code, what's not working in it for you? Second question is, what would you do to fix it? And the third question was, if that resulted in a loss of revenue, what would you do to make it up? Because we wanted them to think about the code uh, and in a revenue neutral way. Um, these were great needs. Uh, people broke up into small meetings and then we had them come back at the end and we did a kind of group report out. I'm a professional facilitator in my day job, so I was up in the front scribbling answers across a piece of paper. Um, the business community really showed up. We worked with the economic development councils, the chambers, we got a lot of small businesses showing up. And they were the ones that came up with some of the things that are in this work group today. We asked them, for instance, did you like that we uh, came out to you? Do you think it was a word, we, was it a good use of time for us to leave Olympia and uh, come out on the road and hear from you? Uh, would you like us to continue this work and make it bicameral and add stakeholders? On both answers to the, that question, those two different questions, 94% well, wow. said yes. Wow. People were very enthusiastic about participating in this. Um, we asked them, what are some of the top things that we should address? So from those group report outs, <clears throat> We kind of took all the top answers um, that sort of really showed up across all four meetings, put them in a survey back out to all the people who had participated and said, okay, you guys came up with all this stuff. What are the top four things that we should be tackling? Um, excessive tax preferences was one. Uh, the fact that we have a regressive code was another. And the fact that the B&O tax was hurting um, small startup and low margin businesses was a third. Um, so we have worked, I think the fourth one might've been that I think it had something to do with capital gains. Honestly, I can't remember. So, um, folks are ready. I think they're really ready to engage in the conversation. <laughs> so, um, I mentioned earlier we're going to have a technical advisory group. Um, so, we built in academic scholars from state research institutions and regional universities, recognized experts in fields of economic taxation, etc., tax law practitioners, because we want people at the table who are technical experts in tax administration, which is why I was talking to the Bar Association on Friday. The CPAs testified in favor of this legislation because uh, they really want us to, to do a code that makes sense. Um, in the recognized experts field, one um, that I really want to um, highlight, and this kind of goes to your question earlier about income tax. So I'm just gonna put it out there. Some people are like, is this just a back-end way to get an income tax? <coughs> And my response is, I personally support an income tax, but I'm not presupposed
proposing what the outcome of this work is going to be. And part of the challenge that we have to tackle is the economy is changing very rapidly. And I mentioned earlier, we're not the only state that's behind, right? Other states that do have an income tax are also having their revenue sources decoupled from economic activity. And so one of the experts that we're bringing in is somebody who's an expert on AI and uh, artificial intelligence and automation. So we can just think about what might we need to do? It might be pretty innovative, might be different, might be untested, but how could we look at taxation in a different way to capture revenue when we have the gig economy proliferating, for instance? Um, I'll come back to you in just two seconds. Why that's so important? So in that 2001 report, one of the 2001 recommendations was streamlined online sales tax. Okay, in 2001, internet was starting to happen. They could start to see the move uh, to sales on the internet. Uh, that was 2001. It took us until 2017 to adopt streamlined wow. online sales tax. And only this last year did the state Supreme Court, sorry, the National Supreme Court rule on this. Um, uh, it's called the Wayfair case. And it basically said that yes, states can tax economic activity for people in its state, even if the business is physically located outside of the state. So we took care of that in 2017 with a workaround. Now it's federal law or it's federal case law, I should say. So we're kind of bad at keeping up with technology as yeah. government, and, and part of what this work group is about is let's be really <coughs> thoughtful and start to think five steps ahead about what the economy might look like in five to 10 years, and start to think about how we change our tax structure to reflect that. So who knows, it might be an income tax, it might not. Funny enough, the people that are asking for an income tax, it's the business community, yeah. right? They want a corporate income tax, or they're saying, Basically, the hate gross receipts, corporate income tax is a tax on profit or net receipts. And they're scared of change. This is what came out of last year, scared of change. Mm -hmm. So said, next step, why don't we model like margins tax, this is what Texas has, and corporate income tax. And we said, fine, we'll do that. And in the 2001 report, they had two different versions of value added tax. We're gonna model that too. So we're gonna model four different possible replacements <coughs> to be enough in this work group. Uh, so hopefully we'll finally solve this problem. Yes, question. I just wanted to say, when I was 12, we went to Vancouver. BC or BC. America's Vancouver? BC. I'm from America's Vancouver. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Carry on. The thing that impressed me so much was we stopped at a, uh, a pharmacy, went into the store, purchased something, and I said, I was noticing that there were all these little cans or whatever they were on the counter and I said, what are these about? And they said, oh, these are the taxes. This is for the long-term care facility that we're gonna build. Yeah. <coughs> this one is for the hospital that we're building. And this one is for this. And they knew everything. I watched people put their pennies wow. into that with a smile on because they knew exactly where their taxes were yeah. going. So my point is mm -hmm. that we need to be totally aware yep. as taxpayers and as individuals of where those funds are going and coming from yeah. so that we can yeah. smile about it and understand that we're participating in it and that also that we're gaining from it. Your point is very well taken and I'll tell you in that 15 minute presentation that we did at the beginning of the meetings last year. No, it's okay. We actually included not just a pie chart on where the money comes from, but a pie chart on where the money goes. Because even though we're trying to focus on the conversation on the tax structure, we know we can't ignore the conversation about where the money goes. Um, and so right now, I'm pretty focused on the how we collect and from who we collect the money. But I know that as we get further down this effort, we're gonna have to revisit how we talk about where the money goes as well. Thank yes. you. Yes. I am a little nervous to ask you this question because the whole subject is over my head. <laughs> you know what? Give yourself more credit. You pay taxes. You probably know more than you think you know. <laughs> We're in the 32nd district. Uh -huh. And I'm a huge fan of our former Senator Marilyn Chase, mm -hmm. who worked on this issue yep. for many, many, many years. Yes. And um, I'm just w wondering if you have been able to, you were, find any building block from her work upon which to further build. Like I, I, I have not, not a challenge, but I'm yeah. just wondering, I haven't heard you mention taxing intangible income, which is something that she 
try to move the table by expanding revenue by taxing intangible income because they don't evidently tax any of stocks and bonds yep. and things like that now. Yep. But I didn't hear that mentioned. So I'll just point out, leave all options on the table. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm not so this bill is about process. And I truly believe that we have failed because we did not get the process right. Mm -hmm. We did not bring the right people to the table. We did not involve the public. Mm -hmm. You know, many times, I get to say this in general as a legislator, this is something I've learned a lot too. You can't just drop bills and expect them to pass. You have to have a movement behind it. You have to have people invested. And that's the part, I mean, let me just finish this piece. I, I, I <coughs> went to my first session that were like my brilliant ideas and I had to work so hard to get anybody to pay attention because frankly it was like my idea it was um, uh, compensating school board directors more because they cap out at like $4,600 a year. Um, and like I couldn't get anybody to come along with me. I got it pretty far just on like brute force. <laughs> it's kind of a style. Um, but I can't get across the finish line. It was a really good lesson to me on a totally different topic that you have to have stakeholders at the table. To the best of your ability, you've got to get them to agree. Uh, I mean, I have, uh, this will toot my own horn for five seconds. In the last two sessions, I have helped to lead, sometimes in front, sometimes from behind, major reform to the juvenile justice system, which is, P.S., major reform to the broader criminal justice system, because you catch them when they're early, it's, you're getting them upstream. And I got people like prosecutors and the defenders to agree. Victims associations and the judges, uh, ACLU and you know other uh, law uh, legal professionals. You get this like random group of people together, and suddenly it's magic. And that's the thing that I think when I say we've been trying to do this for so long, it doesn't mean that every part of that was wrong. It just means I'm trying something a little bit different. And so yes, all the options, all the policy proposals that have been up there, all options are on the table. I'm just outlining a process that that's the piece that really hasn't been tried. Yeah. I'm curious about the pharmaceutical companies and the health insurance companies because we've been lear learning in our healthcare subgroup that 30% of the um, nation's medical care money is going into that industry. Yeah. How do they pay taxes in our state? And yeah. a segue on that is um, if we have these two movies about them mm -hmm. um, and we're trying to get small businesses and middle businesses to understand <coughs> how it, the, the health care bill yeah. is driving up, you know, everything right now because yeah. it's 20% of our income. Yeah, um, so to answer, oh. particularly somebody who works for a small business, our health care costs go up mm -hmm. very sharply every year. So I think small business is a great audience for you to work on, so good work. Um, so this is one of the really interesting things. Um, first or second week of finance committee this year, we had um, quite a few different um, work sessions where we talked about, had different people come in. And we had a demographer and economist come in. One of the things that I did not know um, is that the Washington state population is actually aging pretty rapidly. We're seeing a lot more retirees come to the state. Not, um, not that rapidly. Uh, uh, <laughs> not that rapidly. They're coming from out of state, not referring to <laughs> but, but to your point, you know, when you have people come in and the, the, the uh, a majority or some a larger share of their spending is on health care versus previously maybe it was on entertainment or, or retail items, right? Well, we tax, you know, retail items, uh, but we don't tax health care in the way that, you know, we, we collect an equal amount of revenue, if that makes sense. So one of the things that we have to think about in our analysis is, okay, um, how do we think about changing our taxation? We don't want to increase the cost of health care any more than it is. So there's a real resistance to increasing taxes on any part of the health care system. And I saw that a lot this session. Yeah. Um, but how do we account for the fact that there's more spending happening in the health care sector as it relates to our challenge to collect revenue? Yeah. So much of the profits is going to um, the middle people, the insurance companies. Sure. And, uh, so is there a big problem taxing people that are making billions of dollars every year? No, I mean, I do think like we had, and I don't know where it ended up, the pharmacy benefit manager, uh, there was a, I think, Steve, is it a tax preference that PBMs have, pharmacy benefit managers? That, 
Yeah, I think we had, there's a preference in there that we tried to get rid of, and we ran into the bus saw. Yeah. Uh, we don't want to increase cost of health care, but. So let me just say, there's a lot of layers to this work. Um, I don't commit to a lot of things in the sense that we have to have a, we have to stay on, we have to stay within our scope to a certain degree. Um, there are, just like there's a proviso working on the pathway to an you know, adequate, equitable, transparent, and stable tax code, there's also a pathway to creating a universal healthcare system <laughs> study and work that's being done by a separate group of people, uh, also through the budget. You know, so uh, we all have to sort of take our piece of the fight and work on it, so this is the piece that I'm working on. I've got a couple more slides, so Carol, go ahead. I I'll basically just wanted to know, now that Neely has retired, who's replaced her? Him? Him. Him, and um, I think you referred to it, this has evolved, so it's bigger now? Yep, or? so it's, it's fine. Where's it going? So we had Senate, we're adding senators, and we're adding two Great. people per caucus rather than one. Um, the appointments have not been made. Um, okay. So the ranking member of the House Finance Committee that replaced Representative Neely is Representative Orcutt. So like I would assume that, uh, actually, I mean, Representative Orcutt has told me himself that he plans to serve on this. Oh, cool. um, and he actually came to all the meetings last year, knowing that um, Representative Neely was retiring. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ed came to all the meetings with us. Right. And then not only did I go, but I basically brought one member of the Finance Committee. So Jerry Paulette came to one meeting, right. Sharon Wiley came to another meeting. So yeah. someone else. Yeah, okay. somebody else was there. Lori Dolan, who's now unfortunately rolled off of the Finance Committee, came. Um, so we, right. we've had people there, so that's who will do it. Um, I'm just, I don't know who's gonna. Right, when will those be? They put out the call to the House. Um, I think the Senate's made one decision on the Democratic side, but um, it's all still up in the air. So really quickly, I talked about um, robust analysis. Uh, so I mentioned updating the 2001 report and updating the VAT tax. Um, we are also looking at border states tax structures. So we, there's, we know the answer for Idaho, but I think it's important to also look at Oregon too. What, for instance, how would we fare if we took Idaho's tax structure and overlaid it with Washington's economic activity. Last time we did that analysis, it was five billion dollars more of revenue. I can't remember if it was per year or per biennium. Uh, that liberal bastion of Idaho, right? Yeah. 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 Right. So, uh, so looking at that, but if you're in a border city, you also have to think about harmonization of the tax codes with border states. Uh, and again, one of those principles in having a well-designed tax structure is that your tax code is it influencing people's behavior? I can tell you as somebody who grew up on the border in Clark County and who was from a low income family, we absolutely went to Oregon yep. for school shopping and other things like that where there wasn't sales tax. And that's what people do to survive. So we have to think about how we design our tax structure to keep up with that. Um, as Steve, you mentioned, we also want to update on how our, current, our overall tax burden effective tax rate, how that compares to other states and the federal average so that we understand where we fit. Um, and this last thing, tax incidence analysis, that's trying to understand those pass-through taxes like B&O and property tax. So making sure that we're not kind of losing sight of who actually ultimately pays that when we're doing our analysis. So this is a four-year process. And somebody said, God, well, can you do it sooner? I said, we can if you would like to lose. And they're going to look at me like, I'm like, this stuff takes time. So Department of Revenue alone needs until December of 2020 to update all of the data that we're talking about. They have to staff up, they have to hire people. Um, we have limited number of people who are allowed to actually look at IRS data, and it's not consultants, it's, it's state staff. Uh, it's people that work for a state government, so they have to staff up. There's a lot of analysis to be done, so they've got until December 2020. They'll provide preliminary findings. We'll have meetings as the tax structure works. <laughs> We'll only one by the end of the year and like four next year just to kind of be a sounding board for them and let them check in and ask us questions as they do an analysis. The big part that I'm excited about, about two years from now, or pardon me, in the session of 2021, January 2021, um, we're going to take what we've learned from the analysis and start to test it with those key stakeholders, the low margin you know, startup businesses, uh, low and middle income taxpayers get ready for the public engagement, update the legislature. But then when we get to June 2021, large scale multi-city public engagement, we set a minimum of five meetings. So we did four last time, minimum of five this time. Geographically dispersed, which is really important. Um, and collect feedback. And how we do that is still up in the air. Um, I, the small group Oops. thing was super fun and engaging. It's also really hard to do. We hit 100 people in one meeting. 
and we were running out of time for everybody to report. So we're gonna have to think really deliberately about how we get feedback that we can use. In the 2022 session, um, the tax structure work group comes back and reports out to the legislature, kind of summarizing that feedback that we heard on the road. And then the idea is that in 2022, uh, we're as a tax structure worker of working on developing legislative proposals. It's a campaign year, so it's probably gonna take us most of the year because we have other things that are happening that year. Uh, but the idea is to come back in the session of January 2023 and introduce proposed legislation. I am aspiring for bipartisan solutions. A girl can dream, we can try, but I think that that should be the goal because again, we have tried to take things to the ballot, we have lost. We have tried to bring people along with us, it's hard and complicated. If we can get to a bipartisan solution, but if we can't, we'll go our separate ways and I'm sure other people will come up with proposals, but we're gonna try. And we built in one extra year that says if we fail in the 2023 session, we wanna do a kind of mini uh, roadshow to take out and go out to the public and say, okay, we have this bill, what did we get wrong? What did you like? See if we can refine it in 2023. Come back in the 2024 session and try to propose it again. And folks, if I can't get it done by then, I'm gonna pass the baton to the next person who is as crazy as I am to try to fix the most vexing political issue in Washington state history. <laughs> Kara. Um, I have two statements and a question. Yes. Uh, one statement is I actually live in your district and I want to thank you for all your work. Thank you. Thank you. The second thing is thank you for um, coming from um, Longview and the dark side. Um, <laughs> uh, not that Longview is the dark side, but it is a conservative area. Yeah, and, for sure. Um, it's wonderful they introduced you. <laughs> well, actually, life. Battleground gets credit, not Longview. Yeah, yeah, I'm yes, sorry. Well, I misspoke Battleground. Anyway. Well, and I, I think I will yeah. say, and I say this all the time, I represent the 36th district, but I serve the entire state of Washington. Right, of because I care about, if a kid is not getting access to a basic education, I, I don't care if they're in Seattle or they're in right. Battleground, I care about them. Yeah. And I think it's important that those of us who represent Seattle districts yes. get outside the bubble. Well, and it's great you actually have that background, so you, yeah. you've lived it. Yeah. And my, so my question is, yes. um, how can we help you? Yes, okay, so as I mentioned in the timeline, really, um, we're kind of heads down for the next two years doing the analysis, but um, I really want to use this time to sort of try to, you know, with my own time, do whatever I can to start to tell people what's happening, bring people along, so that when those meetings are happening two years from now, you guys are ready, right? Um, and I expect stakeholder groups are going to do the same. I expect my Republican colleagues are going to do the same, right? So we've got two years to, so people understand what the process is and how they can engage. What I would say is for now, Department of Revenue hasn't even had a chance to put up the website yet, where I'm sure they'll put up the presentations and whatever meetings we have. Um, I'm sure they'll have like an email sign up to be notified. Because they don't have that yet, I would just encourage you to email me directly. Um, my staff, we're trying to kind of keep track of who's interested and you know where there are technical experts i love this the 36th district we are like so rich with like human capital so i have had like a, rec a retiring uw professor who is an economist uh, another retired economist from the secret service that like want to be helpful and i'm like maybe we can somehow get you on the technical advisory group i think dor is willing to listen to anyone with technical expert on the technical advisory group piece people that actually have technical expertise on taxes um we're trying to figure out what that group looks like um so if you have somebody you recommend somebody who is like an academic i'd love to hear it but if you just want to be on the list so you know when the meetings are coming email me and i'll put you down for that too we need all of it yeah well i was just going to also add that this group's going to be canvassing quite a bit in the coming weeks and months and i think that every conversation we have where taxing taxation comes up we have to, it's education and outreach yeah. that comes before Yes. you know anything else I mean, we have people have to be talking about this because there's so much that people don't know and they they just think another tax mm -hmm. you know and so you just, i think we have to be having this conversation <coughs> because we're pretty good at this every single place we go every door we knock on yeah. every you know block party barbecue whatever we have to be talking about this because yeah. people don't fully understand it so education and outreach is something that we do and i think that we need to remember that we're always doing this work that's what i just wanted to add they, I agree, and I would just say messaging is really important, and so I think it's, again, because it's so simple for some people, it's easy to go sideways. Mm -hmm. I talk about modernizing and rebalancing the tax code. That's 
right? It is out of date, um, it is out of balance that the wealthiest among us are not paying their fair share. When you tell people that the lowest income people in the state are paying six times more in taxes than the wealthiest among us, people are horrified. When we say that we are treating small startup and businesses the same as large corporations and they're paying tax not if, even if they're not profitable people go what yeah. like they don't they don't know so i think it's important that it doesn't just become a like well you know tax cuts it's like no right. actually we need to invest in our if our communities to thrive we have to invest in the things that you know match our values yeah. And I think that people know that in theory, but it's hard sometimes. So I just encourage people to talk about investing in thriving communities, yep. and the way that we're gonna do that is modernize and rebalance the tax code. I saw two hands. I just, yeah, I just wanna say one thing. Yes. Graphics really work. Yeah. I know. So the from and the to, yeah. and if you take our values to think new. Yeah. Healthcare. Yeah. Um, our uh, taxes, our uh, property taxes, yeah. how we could, how those could be reconverted into some kind of a graphic that we can see. Yeah. That's, then we can Sounds like I need to put my pie chart back in the presentation. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, thank you for that feedback. Yes, I can see people responding to that education. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about legislators? <laughs> so, I mean, there are yeah, people. They have this problem for a long time. So I, this, thank you for this question, and I am gonna go back to what Barack Obama said in the health Barack Obama, he wanted to increase access to health care, right? He was there. And what he said was, make me do it. Make me do it. We need pressure. We need pressure. We need to know that people have our backs. And this is why I tell my constituents, even if you agree with me, I still want you to email me. Every counts. Yeah, because I'm keeping an eye on who's emailing me about what issues. And I want to, it's like, it's nice to have affirmation that people agree with me. So even the people that are there that are, you know, are, are, are good on the issue, whether or not they prioritize it has a lot to do with what their constituents want. So I really think this has to come from the public, it has to come from taxpayers. That's why I think community engagement mm -hmm. is the piece that's been missing in every effort that we've tried, mm -hmm. uh, and we gotta do it right. Janet, and I saw you over here. Just uh, wanted to uh, thank you um, on another issue. Yes. Because um, I'm I mean, sure. You're probably, you're probably, uh, <laughs> probably aware that uh, this group, a lot of people in this group, work very hard on the presidential tax return yeah. bill. Yes. And I want to thank you for your support yeah. on yeah, that. Absolutely. Because yeah. we came so close. Yeah. <laughs> but it's coming back. Exactly. And um, take, uh, keep an eye on the news in the next few days because I think there's going to be some good news on Great. this one. Excellent. So, um, the so last question here, and then we should. No wrap. question. I'm born us to move on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 I've got business cards here. If folks want them, um, and and they're, um, I just encourage you to keep in touch. And yes, great. Um, thank you.